Thanksgiving Sylvester family. Welcome. Welcome. If it's got to be winter, it might as well look like this, right? Nice fresh coating of snow. Nice and bright. I, I'll stop at that. I don't, right, Tim? I just won't go. Any, don't want that glass to get half empty. So, okay. Uh, let's start off this morning with announcements. Any announcements for the good of the, the people? I know this is short notice, but uh, nothing. Okay, let's uh, we'll stand and have our uh, opening prayer, and then we'll go continue standing, and we'll sing a couple songs. So, please stand. Our heavenly Father, we thank you again for this beautiful morning in this place of, that we may come and gather to collectively to to worship you and praise. Pray that our actions and thoughts and words today may be pleasing to you, and pray that you be with Steve as he brings a message that uh, it may be your your words, Lord, that we may hear. In Jesus' name, we ask it, and we we'll give it the praise. Amen. Amen. Okay, remain standing and sing a, a familiar tune to all of us. I'm sure Jesus loves the little children. <laughs> Number 399, higher ground, higher ground, 399. May be seated. Prayer requests and and uh, and praises. Good 
Good to be back. Been here, been quite a while since I've been here and uh, did have to suffer some time in Florida, but <laughs> if you gotta come back, come back to this great church family. So will you pray with me, please? Father, we bring prayers to you this morning. Uh, think of uh, Pastor Simon and Laura and Aaliyah, just uh, pray for their health and uh, recovery. Be with them. Um, we have uh, a sister with cancer we lift up to you this morning. Um, we have uh, some folks that are required emergency first responders this morning. We don't know the situation, but you do. And Father, we lift them up to you. We have prayers for a doctor who's uh, <coughs> um, having some issues uh, with uh, his medical license. So we just lift him up to you and, and those involved in that situation. Um, we lift uh, Reagan and her family up to you with continued prayers as she requires more surgery and just pray that, uh, that she's getting closer to 100% uh, health, Father. Um, praise for mom with uh, a brain aneurysm. Um, uh, note of praise that it just went so well and for uh, uh, for husband's support and, and positive thoughts there. We thank you for that, Father. Um, we have a church mission group on their way to Louisiana. We just um, pray for safety for them and um, positive uh, things while they're there. <clears throat> and also prayers for a childhood friend um, that Gene uh, uh, was able to spend time with this week. We thank you so much for that, Father. And of course, prayers for uh, Darlene and her caregivers. We just lift her and the whole family up to you, Father. Uh, just be in that situation. We have a sister with uh, bipolar and, and some health issues. We lift her up to you and that family, Father. And um, pray for uh, Steve as he brings a message this morning. And just pray that what we do here is pleasing to you and that. Uh, uh, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, um, that we can take care of that before this uh, service is over. So just guide us in that in that area for those needs. We thank you for all you do. Thank you for this wonderful church family. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lee. The children are free to go to Children's Church at this point. And we'll read our scripture, which is Exodus 1, 15 through 22. Exodus 1, 15 through 22. I should have added a thanks to, to Steve for only having a short uh, scripture reading this morning instead of the chapter long ones that pastor's been giving me, so. <laughs> okay, Exodus 1, 15 through 22. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew, Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shepera and Pua, when you are helping Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So, so God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all the people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Steve? Actually, Bob, I just wanted to see how you pronounce Shifra and Pua. <laughs> um, Simon asked me a little over a week ago if I could fill in for him. So those of you that are 
kind of on pins and needles about the romance taking place in Ruth. You're just going to have to wait another week <laughs> to see how that, how that turns out. Um, or you could always read the book of Ruth and find out for yourself. Um, we uh, started a little bit late on Sanctity of Life. That was the 16th, I think, or the, actually maybe the 9th. And then, uh, anyways, Simon spoke on that last week. And, and the plan was that I would also share some, but then uh, I was quarantined last week, so I wasn't able to come. And so now you're stuck with me this week. And so uh, I'd like to share a little bit about life resources. And uh, I have a far better person to share that's on video. So, uh, Dan, if you could get the video queued up there, um, we'll take a look at that. And I assumed that the women that would be considering abortion would be young and probably a first time pregnancy. And I found out that is definitely not the case, that any woman can be considering abortion. She can be young, she can be older, she can be married, she can be single, she can be financially secure, she can have no resources. and. I just found that each one of those women, given the set of circumstances that they're in, could be thinking abortion. And we have to figure out how to navigate those choices with her and dig out the reason why she might be considering abortion. And we love to share truth and love here. We do not want to bring judgment on those women. We want them to feel safe and offer them hope. And no matter what circumstance they're in, turn that around and help them choose life for their unborn baby. During my time at Life Resources, the thing that I recall about God the most is that He's faithful. This ministry is absolutely His ministry. It's built on a foundation of seeking God and praying. And I have seen so many changes during my time here. Name changes, location changes, staff changes, building changes, financial challenges. But God has been so good and so faithful and those of us that he calls to this ministry, he equips us for the time that we're here. He is, he is good, he's a good, good God, and it's his ministry, and he's gonna continue to be faithful to life resources, to carry on the mission that he's called us to do. One of my absolute favorite stories of my time working here is about a woman that came to us. She was married, she had a couple of children already, found herself pregnant, not planned. She just wasn't sure she wanted a third child. And she had thought about abortion, so we chatted through some of that and then offered an ultrasound. During the ultrasound, we found out that she was already almost through her first trimester, into her second, and we saw a fully formed baby. And she saw that baby on the monitor and started weeping and crying. And she said, it's a baby. I cannot have an abortion now. And she did go on to carry that baby and parent. And the Lord allowed me to see her several times throughout the, in the community. I, was a, I saw her at the grocery store one time with her baby. I saw her at a restaurant. The last time I saw her, that baby had grown up to be a toddler. It was around the lake shore and had a life jacket on. The mom was grabbing onto that life jacket and it was just a, such a picture of her wanting to protect that life when if life resources hadn't been here, she could have easily aborted that baby. And if you give to life resources or pray for life resources, you are a part of that story. We can't do it without you. And it's just one of my favorite memories is, is that mom that chose life.
Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your valuing life, Lord, that uh, so much that you sent your son to die for us, Lord, uh, to show how much you love us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you've given us your word. We pray that uh, as we look at that today, Lord, that you'll penetrate our hearts and give us understanding. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I have a few more pictures I'd like to show after. That was Beth. Uh, she is a retired nurse from Life Resources, and uh, if I was smart, I'd stop now because she really said things well, but uh, nobody's ever accused me of being too smart, so I'm going to continue on. Since I got all this stuff anyways, Wayne, I might as well, right? Okay, so uh, Dan, if you could get uh, that first picture up there. Um, this is the bad news, and I wanted to get this over with uh, right away. An estimated 61 million Preborn babies have been uh, lost through legal abortion since 1973. Uh, you know, and Pastor had a different number last week, and you hear different numbers. The, the fact is that any number is, uh, is, is a tragedy. Next picture, Dan. Uh, this is a little bit about what Life Resources does. It offers pre, free pregnancy tests. And uh, I just want to emphasize that with what Life Resources does, free is is a big word there, that there aren't charges for this. And so uh, as Life Resources works to grow its clientele, it doesn't work like a normal business where, okay, you've got more clients, you've got more income coming in, and so you grow your business. This is a business that uh, is growing, but the growing costs the business more in terms of everything that's provided is free. Uh, ultrasounds, you saw Beth talk about the power of an ultrasound in that video, and uh, that was a something that was donated to Life Resources and, a, you know, just a valuable instrument in, in, uh, in helping people to see the truth. Parenting classes, uh, there's shopping incentives, there's a store at, at the Life Resources building that um, people don't have, they don't use their own money, they accumulate points as they attend classes at Life Resources, then they use those points to purchase uh, diapers, uh, kids' clothing, food, uh, there's a crib program, there's a car seat program. Um, Beth said it well when she said, when people come in the door, we want to offer hope and no judgment and, and love that how can we support uh, women, families with their children. Next picture. This woman is just saying that uh, after her appointment, she felt more confidence in parenting and she's now doing things that she thought she could never do. And that's one of the things that we like to do at uh, Life Resources. The next picture is just, again, the idea of ultrasounds, 28 free ultrasounds administered in one of our clinics by uh, uh, life-affirming medical staff. Um, there are a lot of volunteers at Life Resources, and there's also some paid staff as far as the directors and some of the nursing and so forth. Um, and I want to emphasize that, uh, well, I've, I brought this baby bottle today because this is one of the uh, fundraisers that we use along with uh, there's an auction during the year and there's a banquet and so forth. But um, Life Resources is funded strictly by uh, donations. So th the reason for that is that allows us to share, the, be able to share the gospel with any client that comes in the door and we don't have to worry about government saying, oh, you can't do that. Uh, because you're receiving funding from the government, it's uh, by donations that we're able to do that. Um, and that's a tremendous blessing. Um, okay, Dan, you can take that picture down, thanks. Uh, I, my involvement with Life Resources is with the parenting classes, and uh, so I meet a, a lot with uh, men as far as um, what to expect as their maybe their, their wife or girlfriend or fiance is pregnant and going through the pregnancy. So we'll uh, have some videos that share, okay, here's what the experience is there, or here's how you can begin bonding with that baby even while it's in the womb, as far as recognizing voices and, and music and so forth, that there's been a lot of studies done. Um, so that's my role is meeting with dads and trying to encourage them in terms of uh, their fatherhood and their parenting. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the people that come in are coming in voluntarily, but we also get a lot of people that come in that are uh, coming in by court order 
or the courts have suggested to them you need to get some kind of uh, parenting classes, and so then they've uh, been referred to Life Resources. So that's the uh, opportunity that I have. Um, so I just, maybe I'll leave that here as a reminder that uh, there's a basket full of those uh, out in the uh, foyer, so if you're interested in getting one of these and filling them up with change, or you can even put in dollar bills or paper money, that's fine too, but, uh, and I never know when the deadline is for these. Um, all I know is that if you brought one of these with money in it and gave this to me, I'm not gonna tell you, well, no, you're too late, keep your money. Um, I'll take it, <laughs> I'll take it to Life Resources and it'll be used. Um, okay, topic of abortions is a pretty hot topic, not only now, but it has been for several years. And as I was thinking about this, all kinds of arguments come to my mind and, and uh, I can feel you know, my heart rate picking up and getting okay and argue and so forth. And then uh, one of the verses that the men's Bible study is looking at is in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, where it says, we demolish arguments and, and uh, that we, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. But then it ends with, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And that idea of being obedient to Christ and taking captive every thought kind of dominated the argument side of what I wanted to get into and got me more into, uh, okay, what's, what is the, the positives that I can uh, put out in this? So um, I want to stress that God is, there's no question that God is against abortion, um, that he's definitely against it, but then there's no question that God is very definite about his love and that uh, God loves every baby that has been or will be aborted. God loves every woman that has had an abortion or will have an abortion. God loves all the politicians that have voted to support abortion. God loves all the pro abortion providers. The truth is God loves all of us. And when we sin, and we all do, Dan, if you could bring up the next verse, I think I have 1 John 1, 9 there. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. And then it goes on to say, Dan, the next verse in 1 John, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, and every time I look at that, I think if anyone does sin, yeah, that's a given, unfortunately. Um, we have an advocate with the Father, or we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So, despite the bad news of our sins, we've got a tremendous news of how God has provided for us. And if we take anything away today, that would be the thing that uh, Jesus has come to save us. Let's take a look now in uh, Exodus, chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. And uh, I really, as I looked at the story, I, I liked it more and more. It's just a tremendous story of a couple of women that uh, stood strong for God. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua. Now, they just mentioned the two names there. There's not a certainty as far as, okay, how many midwives were there? Did these two represent a group of midwives or were these two the only midwives? There's a dispute even about the, the number of people, of the Israelites at the time. Um, just to give you some background, this is the, the group that, uh, if you look back to Abraham, and then he had his son Isaac, and God had promised Abraham would have all these descendants and so forth, and that God would take care of them. So then there's Isaac, and then there's, after Isaac, he has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob has a bunch of sons, one of whom is Joseph. And Joseph uh, gets abandoned by his brothers, but then eventually comes to a position of power in Egypt. It's amazing how God works this out because then there's a famine in the land 
and uh, Joseph is able to bring his family that's not in, that's in this famine, bring them into Egypt, where there's plenty of food because Joseph had known from God that there was going to be a famine, and he had planned for, to have enough food. So Joseph is able to save his family. Well, then his family settles in Egypt and grows and grows and grows. So at this time, you've got, uh, as it says earlier, the, the Israelites had spread and become numerous throughout the land. And at this point in the story with Shifra and Pua, Joseph and his family have long died. The king who's leader now has no memory of Joseph and all the things that Joseph did. All he knows is that he's got all these Hebrews in his land and he doesn't like them. And so he's deciding, how can I get rid of these Hebrews, these Israelites, because, yeah, they're, they're messing with us. They might get so strong that they'll take over and so I want to eliminate them. And, you know, so he's basically saying, I want to eliminate God's people. So that's why the command is given to Shifra and Pua to, uh, well, it says in verse 16, when you help the Hebrew women who are in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it's a boy, kill him, but if it's a girl, let her live. I don't know how... Um, um, a midwife could hear that and just not, I mean, be heartbroken where their, their king is telling them, a baby boy, kill it. I mean, that just seems so incredible um, that, that somebody would even put out that order. And so you can imagine the, the uh, it must have been the, just the incredulity of the, the midwives that like, what is he telling us to do? That we're going to have to kill the babies that we're going to help be born and that we want to see thrive and we're supposed to kill the boys? And like I said, the idea was that uh, Satan working through this king was trying to kill off the Hebrew people. So in verse 17, though, we see, and this is, I think, the tremendous part is that the Hebrew midwives feared God. I've got, a, I think I have a verse up there, Dan, that is from uh, Psalm 33. I'll just start reading. It says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the deep into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Then it goes on in Psalm 96 to say, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So we are seeing in these verses the idea of fear is, I think with the two midwives, is not a fear of like, oh, God's going to punish us, but a fear of recognizing this is the God that created the universe. He made the heavens and the earth. We're in awe of him. We, like they said here, let all the people of the world revere him. And so that's the, when it talks about the midwives fearing him, that's the sense that they had of, of how tremendous God is. And then also, how could they go against him? It reminds me too of, uh, as I was looking at this, if you recall the story of uh, David and Goliath. And I always, I like the picture there where this Goliath is coming out and then David's there. And David says, this is in 1 Samuel, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. In other words, David had that same knowledge, relationship with God that recognized God for who he is. He is all powerful. And so he's saying to the Goliath, hey, you got a sword, I got God. Okay, there's no contest here. Okay, and that's the way it worked out. Verse 17 goes on to say that the midwives did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. I wrote in my notes here a big yes. Yes, isn't that tremendous news? They let the boys live. Okay, so we get that good news. And... I want to just take a moment to look at the idea of right 
versus rights. The women were given the right to kill the boys. That was one of their rights, to kill the boys. In fact, they were commanded to kill the boys. But they chose, instead of going by their rights, to instead do what is right. And that's something that comes up a lot, I think, in terms of today's world, is that we, we are quick to tell, well, I have my rights. But, but I think slow to examine what is right. And uh, yes, I have rights to do things, but is it right to do that? The idea of, um, we, we talk about civil disobedience, or just, I think, standing standing for what is right. And I wanted to share a few examples. One is uh, to encourage us in terms of, it's not always going to be a big thing that we stand up to, but it can set the example or set a precedence. I know Life Resources, uh, a few years ago, there was the word that there was, in some legislature, I don't know if it was a state or government legislature, there was a bill that was in there to uh, say that all pregnancy centers would need to post information about abortion referrals. Okay, well, Life Resources is a pregnancy center, but we don't refer people for abortions. We talk about alternatives. Okay, we talk about having the baby, about the value of life. And so for the idea of a Life Resources having to post a poster saying, okay, here's how you get an abortion would have been against what we believe. And uh, fortunately, people stood up and voted against that, and it didn't come to pass. So we, didn't, we weren't faced with the decision of, okay, how do we handle this uh, mandate that could possibly be coming down? Another example that I want to share is uh, I have a doctor friend named Rebecca, and she's about the age of uh, some of my kids, and she went through her uh, Training, I think she was training to be a surgeon. She's an OBGYN right now. And, and uh, I remembered back years ago when she had said something about uh, abortion coming up in her training. So I called her this week to ask her about her memories of that. And she said, yeah, that uh, part of her education was that they needed to go and spend, do a kind of a rotation in an abortion clinic. And she's a Christian. So she... Uh, asked if she could opt out of that. And they said, you can. And she was, she pointed out to me, she said, I'd like to be able to share with you how I, you know, some great story of standing strong and, and you know, whatever. And, and she said, no, in fact, there was a precedence for this. Other people had opted out before and it had been accepted. So she said there was a little bit of awkwardness when she did it, but it wasn't like it was, she was really persecuted. And, and I wanted to disagree with that statement in terms of the effect because she stood for what she believed and who knows the effect of that on people to follow where they see a colleague, a friend, a fellow doctor stand for their beliefs. Um, and it came up again in her training where uh, as she's a resident, uh, so they're treating and, and uh, came where she was supposed to be uh, Providing, providing an abortion for one of the patients there. And she said she was at a, a university hospital, so the university would have a, had an ethics committee that would meet and decide whether the abortion was reasonable or not. And so this was one where it was determined that an abortion should go forward. So then Rebecca was in the position of, okay, it's kind of your turn on the rotation. And again, she asked her attending physician, and, and she was allowed to opt out of that. Um, and I give her credit for asking, and then also credit that she was allowed to opt out. And I just think, I wonder how many doctors are put in a position where they don't either feel comfortable to ask that opt out, or have asked and are told, uh, if you opt out of this, then you're opting out of your training, and uh, you might as well opt out of being a doctor because it needs to be there. Um, and then just a more personal story about myself. Uh, I taught in elementary for over 30 years, and so I was part of uh, uh, the state teachers' union, and which is also part of a national teachers' union. And um, 
over the years, I just gradually became more and more aware of how the state and national union were very strong in their statements about support of abortion. And uh, I just remember at the time thinking, how, that seems really so backwards that, I mean, I'm in a teaching pos uh, position. My, my career is about kids. Uh, you know, I make choices all the time of what I, I want the best for these kids, and yet my union is saying we support abortion. It just, that's like saying, wait a minute, I, what, what do we do if there's no kids? Uh, you know, so it just didn't work. And, and I didn't do anything about it for a while. I didn't stand up and say, oh, I object and so forth. I just kind of let that slide. And then I had other people in my life, though, that uh, were pretty strong about their stance for life. And as I listened to them, I think God worked on my heart, and, and I realized, Steve, I've been, I've been missing the boat on this. And so I went to the union, and the unions don't make it, they don't give you a lot of information about how to get out of the union. They're, they're, that's not their plan. So the first option that I was given was, well, you can become a fee payer. A fee payer means that we're going to reduce your union dues because part of your union dues go to support uh, political action. So we, we won't make you pay the political action part. You'll just pay the, the dues that, because you're part of this union. So I said, okay, and uh, did that. And then I would, you know, election times would come around and I'd see how the union was supporting this candidate or this candidate or whatever, and this would be their position. And I'm thinking, I'm embarrassed to say I'm part of that, that union, that I belong to that union. So I went back to the union and said, uh, I want out. Uh, religious objection. I went out of this. And so th they uh, had me go through a questioning time and, and sit down with a group of other teachers and the union officials and say, okay, Steve, what are your beliefs? And back them up and so forth. And I did that and uh, was granted permission to be out of the union. However, it cost me in a sense of money that uh, they said, okay, if you get out, you still are liable for the full union dues now, your money won't go to the union that needs to go to a, a charity that we can agree upon, which was fine with me. We agreed upon a charity and paying the, the full amount was no problem for me either. The big thing was that I got out of the union. Um, not a, uh, I just hoped that that would be something that would be uh, an example that uh, other people could say, okay, there are possibilities here. Because I remember when I was teaching, it, just, it seemed like uh, in this particular case, uh, getting out of something was really made difficult. And uh, I was able to do it along with another friend of mine that uh, was making the same choice. Anyways, verse 18 goes on to say, the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh and said, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. Some people will look at this and say, well, the midwives are lying. So God doesn't like lies, so somehow these midwives are, are bad because they were lying to Pharaoh. We don't know for sure that they were lying to Pharaoh in the first place, but beyond that... Um, whether they were or weren't, look at God's reaction in verse 20. God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous, and because the midwives had feared God, he gave them families of their own. So it looks like if the midwives had been lying, and I don't think that they were, but if they had been, it doesn't sound like God was displeased with them. It sounded like he was saying, you have stood up for life, and because of that, I want to bless you. And again, we see in this how uh, Satan was trying to kill off these people, and the result is they became even more numerous. Uh, he gave the midwives families of their own, but we saw the people increased and became even no more numerous. So Satan is saying, I want to get rid of these people, and God is raising them up to become even more and more. And we see this, this uh, 
final, the next verse where then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, every boy that's born you must throw in the Nile and let every girl live. Uh, Satan didn't stop with his attempt to try and get rid of these people. And uh, if you uh, continue in the story, then you find out, well, that's Moses is the next guy to kind of come along. And as a result of baby boys being thrown into the river, Moses is one of them. And then that's the rest of the story with him. Um, so I just wanted to point out, to kind of close, is that the irony of how Satan works trying to do this and how God is able to take that and turn it around. We saw that where, like I mentioned, Joseph and his brothers, they put him in a well. He gets out of that well, goes through all kinds of things, but eventually gets in a position where then he is saving the lives of his brothers, his family, by how God has worked through Joseph's life. Okay? Or in the book of uh, Esther, where uh, she's put in the position where she can save God's people and then there's this guy that wants to kill her, Haman, and he's plotting against her and so forth, and God turns it around. So actually, what Haman had intended for Esther, as far as killing her, it happens to Haman. And, uh, and then the ultimate is, Satan said, how can I destroy God's people? And has worked against that, and then we have that God sent his son. And has taken what... As, Satan said, I'm going to persecute Jesus and I'm going to have him put to death. And so that, was, that happened. And then how God took that and said, okay, now through Jesus becoming alive again, how instead of death filling the world, we have life, eternal life. So again, that irony of how Satan has taken uh, God has taken what Satan intended for evil and has made it into something good. I'd like to close with uh, these verses from 1 John. Uh, you've seen the influence I had. I was reading the book of John all last year, and so I've quoted from it from the first chapter, the second chapter. Uh, I don't know if I got the one from the fourth chapter about I think God is love. I think I did that. And now the, from the fifth chapter where it says, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And I've said this before up here, that verse, so that you may know you have eternal life, that would be my prayer that everyone here today, everyone listening on the radio, everyone watching this video at some point would know that you have eternal life. And if there's any way that we can help, if you have questions about that, then please ask, and we'd be glad to share what you can do. Um, final reminder before I close, uh, baby bottles, if you're interested, those are out in the foyer. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you that you value our lives, that uh, you look past all of our sins, Lord, and uh, don't let that uh, uh, distract from your love for us, Lord, that you continue to love us, that you offer forgiveness, uh, Lord, that you offer us the gift of eternal life with you. Lord, I'm so grateful for that, the, uh, just to be your child, and uh, just pray that uh, as a community, as a country, that this world can turn to you, Lord, recognize your word for the truth that it is. And also, Lord, just uh, uh, see how you value people and that you want people to come to love you. We just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for the message and, and for your witness and also you, Nan. Thank you very much. Let's close by singing the closing hymn, 382, Be Thou My Vision, 382. <laughs>
be with you all. And have a good week. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel by clicking the link on the upper left hand side of your screen so you can see all of our videos when they come out. Or you can watch last Sunday's sermon by clicking the video link on the bottom left of your screen. From all of us at Sylvester Community Church, thank you and God bless.